favorite spot for Israeli hang gliders. What would happen if they were enemy planes? This is not a hypothetical question. During the painful years in Israel's history when the Syrian army was positioned on the Golan Heights, artillery, tank, and sniper attacks were part of daily reality. This is how Israelis saw the Golan until 1967. And this is how Syrians saw Israel. Massive Syrian forces dominated the Israelis below and fired at civilians and farmers at will. When the Syrians controlled the Golan, they were able to dominate the entire width of northern Israel, all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. not a difficult obstacle. Its bridges and passes make the crossing a relatively simple operation. It does, however, require time, a precious military commodity. Once across the Jordan River, an attacking force is severely limited. It can ascend the mountains only along five existing routes. The Jericho-Jerusalem route, the Jericho-Ramallah route, the Maale ephraim akraba route, the Damia Bridge-Nablus route, the Machola Tubus route. These routes are clearly of prime strategic importance. An attacking army arrives at the top of the ridge, however, virtually nothing can stop its advance into the heavily populated coastal areas to the west. Stations on the mountain ridges provide visual control over the length and breadth of the territory. This means precious warning time, time that can make all the difference. A withdrawal of the Israeli Defense Forces from Judea and Samaria to the 1967 Green Line would enable an aggressor from the east, whose forces are always at hand, to advance unhampered from the Jordan Valley to the Green Line. Any such move would oblige Israel at once to mobilize all of its reserves, bringing the country virtually to a standstill. Thus, even a small enemy force would be able to cause serious damage to Israel with almost no effort. Jerusalem. The capital of Israel and its approaches would be under constant threat. Israel's main international airport would be paralyzed. No plane would be able to land or take off. The fertile fields of the Jezreel Valley would be threatened. The metropolitan industrial complex of Tel Aviv would be under the constant menace of the enemy guns. Israel's narrow waistline from Tul Karam to Netanya would be cut in a matter of minutes. Along the Mediterranean coast in a very narrow strip, 65% of Israel's entire population is concentrated, as well as 80% of our industry. As you can see, we are so small and our resources are so concentrated that we are extremely vulnerable to any attack. We are a country under constant threat. Our survival from day to day depends upon constant alertness, efficient early warning and a realistic assessment of the threat around us. We have to move and counter move, adjust, check and maneuver as daily we watch the factors of a delicate equation slipping further and further out of balance. The Middle East, Israel on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, a country of only four million people surrounded by 22 Arab countries and Islamic fundamentalist Iran. The West continues to maintain the belief that Saudi Arabia is a moderate, stabilizing influence in the Middle East. In fact, the Saudi contribution to stability has been minimal. 
Internally, there are enormous tensions created by its super oil wealth and the over rapid modernization of a traditional society. Unbelievably, the recent drop in oil prices has led to balance of payments problems in a country whose princes are used to limitless spending. In the eyes of the world, Saudi Arabia has stayed out of the front line of confrontation with Israel. The reality is that Saudi oil wealth is used to buy vast armories for other Arab states and terrorist groups like the PLO. In spite of the drop in oil revenue, Saudi Arabia continues its own military buildup at massive levels. In the past four years alone, over 70 billion dollars have been spent to acquire the most sophisticated weapons available today. Under the Ayatollah Khomeini, Iran was whipped into a fervor of fundamentalism and became a center of religious revolution. In September 1980, Iran's sworn enemy, President Saddam Hussein of Iraq, launched an attack which led to all-out war with casualties of well over one million and the cost of more than 130 billion dollars. The war broke all international conventions. Civilian populations were targeted particularly by the Iraqis, in what became known as the War of the Cities. Some 200 missiles were fired indiscriminately at ranges of 600 kilometers and more into the cities of Tehran and Qom, leading to thousands of civilian casualties and creating widespread panic. The world was shocked even more by the open use of chemical weapons and not only in the battlefield. Civilian populations were also targets for gas attacks. In the Kurdish village of Halabsha, it was claimed that more than 4,000 people were killed. Countries hostile to Israel have therefore shown they have no moral restraint in the use of such weapons. So, chemical warheads and long-range missiles have become a factor which Israel has now built into its deterrent strategy. So this is the neighborhood in which we live. Some of the background and some recent events which seem relevant to us. Now we must examine a factor which, when added to these political instabilities, throws our strategic equation completely out of balance. In recent years, the Middle East has been the center of an unprecedented arms race. It has sprung directly from the Arab oil wealth and purchasing power. Western countries have for years been pouring in billions of petrodollars. To recover them, to get them back into their own struggling economies, they are selling tanks, aircraft, missiles, anything they can to the Arabs. The quantities are vast and the Middle East is now one of the world's biggest arms markets. Competition between arms producers is fierce, and where once it was dominated by Eastern Bloc countries, today, because of the petrodollar's recycling, the West is the major supplier, its motive political as well as commercial. <laughs> <laughs> 